the meaning of quantum physics uh, is really in terms of giving us a new worldview that shows clearly how consciousness can be and is the ground of our being. In other words, quantum physics enables us to uh, see directly that we can make sense of the world only if we base the world on consciousness. World is made of consciousness, world is consciousness, consciousness is the ground of being. Qu quantum physics makes this as clear as daylight. How is quantum physics clear as day? Because quantum physics shows you clearly that science, quantum mathematics, which is, in our belief, the most fundamental mathematics, most accurate mathematical description of nature that uh, we have discovered. Uh, this mathematics shows us clearly that the movement of objects are describable only in terms of possibilities, not the actual events that happens in our experience. Quantum physics calculates only possibilities. But if we accept this, then the question immediately comes, who, what chooses among these possibilities to bring the actual event of experience? So we directly, immediately see that consciousness must be involved. The observer cannot be ignored. Observer is part of the description of the world. But the observer is not included in quantum physics. We can only describe the objects, not the subject. So we get the idea that the subject must be more fundamental than the objects. Consciousness is more fundamental. Consciousness must be the ground of being of which objects are part, but not all of it. And these objects then are, can be described as waves of possibility, and quantum physics succeeds in giving this description very accurately and gives probabilities so that we can do science on the basis of it whenever there is a large number of objects and large number of events. But when you speak of individual objects and individual events, then this very intriguing choice, the word choice by consciousness out of this possible events, the actual event of experience comes in. And so for the first time, science encounters free will. Consciousness is free because there is no mathematical description of the subject in our science. Only objects can be described mathematically and only to the extent that there are possibilities. The question still remains paramount, who is the chooser? And when we see that, then we see that the chooser is free. There is freedom of choice. And of that freedom of choice comes our actual experience. Those are the discontinuous experiences that I was telling you about. Now, of course, we get conditioned, and then the certain apparent continuity reigns and that's what misleads us, that's what con confuses us. The conditioning confuses us. The conditioning brings up an apparent continuity in our experience. So how does that translate the, the, the observer and consciousness? What is the, how does, in quantum physics and, and the, the understanding of how the, the world works, how does that translate down to me? That's, it. that's of course, is the ultimate the issue. What, what does all this observer or collapse of possibility wave, as the physicist would say, into an actual event of experience. From that, how do we get to me? Now, that me, as I said, is a result of a lot of conditioning. So, although, ideally, in every experience, we get a whole bunch of possible responses. But in uh, what happens because of our memory, quantum measurement, every observation can be looked upon as a quantum measurement, this quantum measurement produces brain memory. These brain memories are activated every time we encounter an experience uh, again. A repeated, ex repeated stimulus will always elicit not only the original impression, but also this repetition of memory impressions. And it is this working of the memory, I sometimes put it this way, we always perceive something after reflection in the mirror of memory. It is this reflection in the mirror of memory that gives us that sense of I-ness, who I am, namely 
a pattern of habits, a pattern of uh, memories, a pattern of past. And that is where I enter the picture. All of our meanings of who I am come from this reflection on the mirror of memory. So we miss the quantum discontinuity. And because we miss it, that's why we ask, well, but that is not me. Because quantum is talking about discontinuous quantum leaps, possibilities and probabilities, free will. But we find in our ordinary me, all these things are quite elusive. The illusion will be cleared up only when we are prepared to work a little. We have to work our way back to this freedom, to this consciousness as the holder of the freedom of choice. If we work our way back, then this question that you asked, how does it relate to me, will become clearer and clearer. So I'm wondering, like, which came first, the chicken or the egg? You know, <laughs> then did where, did consciousness come first, or did, where did consciousness come from? I don't even really answer that question. But the consciousness <laughs> is the ground of being. Therefore, it is the one and the original. The chicken and the egg question, however, is very important. Uh, for example, how does this one consciousness become a subject-object split experience? There, when we analyze it fully. And uh, here I must mention Doug Hofstetter's book, uh, Guadal Escher Bach, where there is a good analysis of this question. And we find indeed that how consciousness becomes split into a subject of experience and an object which the subject experiences, how this split occurs. This has to do with what we call a chicken and egg kind of hierarchy which uh, technically Hofstadter calls tangled hierarchy. This hierarchical tangle is inherently present in a quantum measurement. Quantum measurement is not a simple hierarchical process. Instead, it's a tangled hierarchical process involving the object, involving the brain, involving how we experience the world. So because the quantum measurement involving the brain is tangled hierarchical, this, this chicken and the egg kind of, chicken or the egg which came first kind of hierarchy, we cannot really decide it. There is no decision. They're, they both are as important in the hierarchy. When we realize that, then we can understand how our self-reference arises this subject-object split arises from a quantum measurement. It's a little bit uh, like the uh, picture of drawing hands by M.C. Escher. You might have seen it. The left hand draws the right, and the right hand draws the left. But who is really drawing them? It's not really either one. It's really Escher that is drawing them both. Hmm. Similarly, subject and object seem to arise from tangled hierarchical quantum measurement in the brain, but it's really not the brain that is causing it. Just as left hand and right hand in the picture is not really causing the picture. Which, which, what is causing the picture is M.C. Escher, which is outside of the picture, transcends the picture. The same thing, consciousness is ultimate creator of the downward causation, creator of the illusory separateness of subject and object. Although, from inside, it seems like subject is creating the object and the object is creating the subject. But ultimately, it's neither. It's really consciousness. This subject-object split is an illusory manifestation. It seems that way. Then why, why do I feel separate from you? That's precisely the point. So I am an object in your consciousness. You are identifying with your brain, which is also an object in your consciousness, but you are identifying with it. That's what tangled hierarchy does. Now it's making sense to you, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. That's what everyone, every one of us have that I-ness. This brain is special because this is the subject of my experience. And I'm looking at you. You are an object 
in my consciousness, in my awareness, you are separate from me. You are secondary also because I, the vehicle of this brain that I identify with, is seeing you as an object in my consciousness. So you are secondary to me. All this is the result of this tangled hierarchy and this conditioning of that identity. So ultimately, if I am able to let go of the subject object and just I accept the concept that we are all one, then that would alleviate the separateness? Uh, yes, accept is the first step. <laughs> but remember, it still has to come to you that in separate notion has to come to you directly. Mm -hmm. The observer is the observed. This is a quotation from the mystic Jiddu Krishnamurti. Observer is the observed, but it's not just a conceptual reckoning of that. If you just conceptually reckon it, then it's good. It's a good starting point. But then meditate on it and meditate on it, and then that subject-object split will disappear and that's what we call in East Indian jargon is samadhi, or Zen Buddhist jargon is, is satori, or in Christian jargon, an encounter with the Holy Spirit, because in the Holy Spirit there is no subject-object split. So then you really have to make a distinction then between philosophy or knowledge or concept and experience. Philosophy and knowledge or concept are all secondary to this experience of wisdom. In this wisdom, there is no separateness. The separateness shrinks to the recognition that observer is the observed. Whereas the split comes in the identification with part of the object spectrum, namely my brain. So when we recognize directly, by direct experience, that we are capable of bridging that separateness, then I know that there really isn't any separateness ultimately. I am one, for the sake of experience, have become two or many, but it's only an illusory separateness. I am still one, because this separateness is just an imposition on my oneness, just as we make chalk marks on a blackboard. The board remains unity, however many chalk marks I have made. So consciousness remained that one always, except that many experiences, many manifest experiences are being created in this consciousness, which then become the source of our apparent separateness and confusion. So the, the reason that I'm looking and seeking these answers are what why is this, is this important to me because it, it helps me to stop feeling so separate and sad and alone? Or does it tell me that, oh, I can create, finally I can create money in my hand, I don't have to worry about all working? Or what does it kind of mean to me, all of this stuff that we just... So step by step, the first thing that it, as soon as you hear this, you know, um, 70s are a good example when Fred Allen Wolf actually first coined this phrase, I create my own reality. So uh, what did the New Agers did, do? Well, the New Agers, um, I'm just using this word, phrase New Ager, not pejoratively, please, but as a description of the people who were influenced by the physics that was getting done at that time. And the physics was very elementary. We were imposing some new phrases on a still predominantly materialistic belief system. The belief system was that everything is made of matter, and therefore, material investigations and material pursuits are very important. So what did we do? We came on that, we superimposed on that, this new dictum, quantum physics dictum. Dictum is correct. I create my own reality. And the first thing that people started creating are Cadillacs, right? There was a whole tradition that, um, that got created in one spiritual tradition comes to mind. I don't mention name. But uh, they actually mm, meditated that way, meditated to manifest material wealth. I'll manifest a Cadillac for myself. Very soon, however, it was recognized that Cadillac is a little bit hard. So some traditions, some uh, very famous uh, teaching traditions, which again, I won't mention names, they started uh, giving the idea that we can at least create parking spaces. Remember that? That's, that's in the 70s. So we did that. 
But after a while, it became clear, uh, thanks to uh, Ludwig Buss uh, in Australia, myself at Oregon, and uh, Casey Blood at uh, Rutgers, uh, it became clear that the place from where we choose to create my own reality, that place of consciousness is a very special, non-ordinary state of being, where the subject-object split tend to disappear, the samadhi or satori that I was telling you about. And it is from this non-ordinary state that I choose. And therefore, the ordinary, ordinary uh, exaltation of the New Ager also disappeared until it was forced to face the reality that there is really no free lunch. We have to meditate and reach these non-ordinary states of consciousness before we become the creator of our own reality. That took a while, but now I think finally people are recognizing that there is no shortcut, but the cut is not that long either. It's not that hard. It's not that hard. We have been engaging in creativity for a very long time. We have created a great amount of art, music, even science, great amount of it. So there are many people who are experienced with creative process that eventually leads to this discontinuous leap towards this non-ordinary state of consciousness. As this is being clear, we are getting a new wave of a new generation of enthusiastic investigators who are ready to take this leap. And then it means a whole lot to me because I become different in the process. I become empowered in the process. I become a lover of creativity in the process. I become transformed in the process. I am capable of experiencing reality at a much more subtle level, in a much more loving level, if you will. And uh, I become happier. I really begin to participate in the whole movement. David Bohm's word comes to mind, holo movement. I become a participant of the total movement of consciousness, not just my individual, very solipsistic movements that I'm familiar with. So my whole looking worldview, my whole looking of reality, my worldview becomes different, much more alive. Instead of playing in a small pond, or to use the baseball jargon, in playing in a sandlot ball game, we play in the bigger arena of the world itself. We become a citizen of the universe. How, how about, this has been always been confusing to me, how, it, how does social consciousness or the, play into all this? If I can create my own reality and I'm creating you, are you creating me or how do we end up creating each other? That's the, that's the whole point. So uh, the social consciousness is basic of it because the, the place from which I create, you and I become one. So I can look at your interest and you can look at my interest without any difficulty whatsoever because this individual selfishness, they just disappear. There is, it's just an illusion. It doesn't exist at that level. But actually, when you analyze this, then it's a little bit more subtle. Why? Because it is still this I that does identify, this individual that, that, that does identify, this I has to prepare the groundwork for that leap to that non-ordinary state that I sometimes call the quantum self. So this ego is important in that dance, in the sense that the ego has to prepare, and then when that leap occurs to the quantum self, and we have the great insight, the ego has to manifest that insight. So ego comes in at both manifestation stage and the preparation stage. And because of that, it's a dance of the ego and the quantum self both. We cannot disregard the individuality completely. You know, this is where spiritual traditions sometimes make a mistake. They think that God is everything, you know, their, their word for quantum self is God. God is everything, there's no meaning to the individual. So they denigrate the individual movement. It is both the movement of the individual and the movement of the whole. Mm. It cannot be otherwise. 